Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Well, I want to say welcome to all of you uh, today, and thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Jerry Teo with the Healing Generations Institute with National Compadres Network, and this is the Healing Generations Podcast, and an effort to really create space and dialogue and to bring wisdom of our ancestors, of the medicine, of the teachings that have really got us this far, but also at the same time to discuss and lift up the many years of struggle and trauma that we're still trying to figure out and trying to uh, remedy and, and reform and heal. And uh, I will always begin, you know, by acknowledging Creator and acknowledging the ancestors. So I want to invite you to just take a moment, take a breath. And as you take that breath, uh, recognize that it's come from your ancestors. That breath is connected to generations, generations way back. And so we want to just acknowledge and lift up and say thank you to those ancestors that came before us that in whatever way they were able to uh, to maintain the spirit, their dreams, their hopes, their prayers, they kept this legacy of us, you know, fulfilling our sacred purpose alive. So we want to acknowledge them. And and I, you know, if you've never thought about this before, you know, take that moment to acknowledge your ancestors. You know, we wouldn't be here without them. And and some of us come from many roots. So let's invite all the grandmas in, whatever root you come from. Bring bring them all together. They're all sacred, and they all blessed us. And you know, I had a real blessing grandma, then I had a tough grandma too that would slap you on the head. So I'm embodying all my grandmas in <laughs> today. We want to acknowledge also all your people, um, wherever you come from, um, you know, your community, the barrios, neighborhoods uh, that you're from, and with a special acknowledgement of the uh, caretakers of the land that you're on. So take a moment just to acknowledge those people. I'm on the Tangwa, a Gabrielenio land here, and so wherever you're at, just take a moment and acknowledge the caretakers of that land too, and then you. We want to just acknowledge you as sacred, as a blessing. Thank you for being here with us uh, today. And, you know, for me, I, I am so blessed to be able to, you know, to spend this time with with some very special people. And today, um, feel blessed, feel honored to you know, invite in Sheree Tang, who, you know, I've known for a number of years. We worked together in different um, different projects, but I know of her from the impact that she's made you know, for probably 30 to 40 years now, you know, in, in the areas of social and racial justice. She's been a champion and an organizer, an advocate, a network facilitator. You know, she builds capacity, but she helps people also with funds and, and how to evaluate what they're doing to recognize the significance of what they're doing, you know. And so she brings a really a, a commitment and a spirit. You know, whenever I'm with Sheree, it's, it's like this joy. I just, I, you walk in the room and you feel the joy. And in the work that she does, she brings that love and that medicine of joy. But she's a hard worker too, and she'll she'll work you. She you know she's facilitating something with you. She's gonna make you work and think about it, and so we can get to a better place, you know. And that's really um, you know what I feel when I when I'm with her is that we can have a good time, but we're gonna do some work. We're gonna take care of some business to make it better for the community. So Sheree, I want to welcome you and invite you to to uh, to greet the folks that are listening here today. Such an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. And to the network, I'm so blessed to be here. I welcome you. I welcome your spirit, your bodies, your minds, your heart. And that we are together, right? The million miles of mycelium under our feet connect us all to each other, to this earth, to all the power that we have and are fighting for in the world. I greet you this morning with a lot of love and gratitude. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and so let us begin. Let's see, let's let's talk a little bit about you and and who you are and your people and your journey and you know your that journey and the many lessons that that come along that way. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and, and your people and, and, and your family and, and where you come from and all of that. Mm, thank you for the invitation. 
I was born a British subject mm. on my mother island of Hong Kong. Mm. This year I turned 63. Mm. Hong Kong was given over to the British Empire for China losing the Opium War. It was handed over like a poker chip. Mm. And the land of my ancestors, uh, it's a beautiful harbor. It's called Hong Kong. Smell good harbor. And back then it was a fishing village, which then quickly became an international magnet of commerce as capitalism raged around the world. I'm the fifth child of my parents, the fifth and the youngest. My mom, Chen Maonian, my dad, Deng Jinchen. Our people came from the southwest region of China in Sichuan, right where all the hot peppers come from. Mm. And in 1949, when the Communist Party took over the mainland, my parents thought that it was going to be, oh, just an interruption, politics, we'll be back. So they left mm -hmm. with one suitcase and three of their children. Before them, I come from a lineage of public servants. My grandfather was the provincial governor of the largest region in China, right, mm. of Sichuan. So I come from a lineage of well-paid, basically politicians mm. in my lineage. From my dad's side, I don't know much about them. He was the only child. I met my grandmother on my father's side whom my mother did not favor mm. because she never recognized her as a daughter-in-law and none of her four daughters. She only wanted pictures taken with her son mm. and his son, my brother. So patriarchy and patriarchal norms run deep in my family. Mm. And one more thing that recently I realized is, why do I have such bad feet? <laughs> In the middle of the night, my feet would just throb for no reason. And they hurt. All my sisters have this. And a couple of them actually had surgery on their feet. Mm. And those didn't work. So I realized... I poked around, you know, bad feet, Chinese women. <laughs> Why is this? Jerry, there's been a thousand years history of binding women's feet in mm. China. From the time girls are four years old, they have their feet broken each night mm. and wrapped in bandages that will keep their feet small like a uh, post-it. Four-inch lotus feet was the standard of beauty for Chinese women. So basically, my ancestors, my grandma, my great-grandma, all of them walked around with stubs as feet. So I say that to remind myself of the generations of healing that needs to happen, starting with my feet and to my heart to my bodies. I want to reclaim what my ancestors did not have. And I want to be proud that I am their dream, their wildest dream. I have size seven feet, which compared to other <laughs> Chinese women are pretty big. <laughs> so that's a little bit about my journey. I came to this country when I was 11 years old. I did not speak English. My dad died when I was four. After that, my mom said, girls, you got to be independent. You got to be self-reliant. And you're going to work hard for everything that you're going to get in this life. Mm. She was quite angry that she was whittled at 44 with five kids to support, both sets of parents. She became a math teacher in Hong Kong. I went to the school where my mom taught. At 11 years old, she decided 
we should come to this country because it had a free and good education system. My older brothers and sisters were already here, so we came. We lived outside of Boston at a time in 1971 at the height of bus stop, mm. right? White parents, mostly white women, stopping busing as a method of school integration. Mm. I would watch TV to learn English and I would watch these white women throwing rocks as big as my cell phone at little black children coming off yellow school buses from Dorchester, Jamaica Plains, Roxbury, right? All the black communities into the South End. I was horrified. Mm. I remember feeling so afraid for them, these little children. What did they do to deserve all that? Mm. Why were these white women just yelling and screaming at them and hurling rocks to hurt them? Is that what's going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. Boston in 1971 was an explicitly racist place. Mm -hmm. I remember my English class teacher, her name was Mrs. Sullivan. She had long flowing blonde hair. She was tall, right? I was in the seventh grade. I remember her as this terrorizing figure in my life because I knew she would make me stand up to read in class, knowing the humiliation I would receive for my very cruel middle school classmates, mm -hmm. white classmates. I would shake, my voice would break. Today, I look back and ask, did Miss Sullivan do her job? Mm -hmm. I speak English. And people would randomly come up to me and say, oh, you speak such good English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mei Ying over there, she came here when she was a teenager, and I can barely understand her as a way to compliment me. Mm. Every time, it would bring up that shame, humiliation as an 11-year-old navigating white supremacy norms in this country as my introduction to the American dream. So I grew up in the projects. We moved to Cambridge after a year and it was all black people and all white people and me. So trying to fit in, right? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Who are they? And what's race got to do with this life? I grew up very confused. I was a terrible teenager. I was fighting everybody, everything to try to find my way. I was a thief. I was a liar. I was a hoe. I was a lot of things, mm. trying to find myself my way. Mm. At 17, I was admitted through EOPS, right, to UC Berkeley. I said, I'm out of here, Boston, goodbye. I'm never gonna come back here. Mm. I left for the Bay. I was sitting in class reading Adam Smith, dead white person, and knowing my community across the Bay in San Francisco, Chinatown, Manila Town was on fire defending International Hotel, mm. where older immigrant men had moved into a single room as they aged. The city of San Francisco, headed by Diane Feinstein at the time, mm -hmm. sold the building to the Four Seas Corporation and turned it into luxury commercial building. And we fought. We would stand there all night to defend the hotel from being destroyed. In the end, Feinstein and her running dogs, we called them, won the battle of International Hotel. All the tenants were forcibly removed. I decided I'm going to join the revolution. I can't take reading any more Adam Smith or anybody else <laughs> across the bay. I'm going to devote my life to organizing and to bringing about change. At 17, I joined this organization called Yi Wa Kun, the Righteous Harmonious Fist. It was an organization built in the image of the revolution that was taking place in China, the revolution taking place in Oakland, California, right? Mm -hmm. Spearheaded by the Black Panther Party. 
inspired by the August 29th movement in the Chicano movement, inspired by the Black Workers' Congress headed by Amiri Baraka in New Jersey, by the Brown Berets coming out of the East Coast. Mm -hmm. We were going to make revolution, Jerry, Mm. in our communities, and then we would bring it into a multi-ethnic solidarity movement for fundamental change. I spent from the time I was 17 to 32 inside this radical nest of fellow comrades and audacious dreamers for what this country and this world could be. That liberation and freedom would not be only a dream or promise. We were going to make it happen. When I turned 30, I realized, ah, it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. (laughs) Um, You know, we were organizing. I was in L.A. Uh, I was in New York. I came back to the Bay. I went to Watsonville. So organizing alongside garment workers, restaurant workers, cannery workers, farm workers, and standing shoulder to shoulder with tenants who refused to live one more winter with no heat and hot water in New York, Mm -hmm. Chinatown. Mm -hmm. I've learned everything I know from organizing. Mm. And the power that comes from a group of people who are clear about what they want to do, why they want to do it, and bringing the life's energy to change. I remember them today as my teachers. Many of them are now ancestors. They've taught me so much about being hopeful, determined, optimistic, and unrelenting. Mm -hmm. I continue to cherish and live into those values today. So what have I learned along the way? I have learned that our struggles are long. Mm. The eight generations that it has taken and will take for our dreams and our longings to become reality and to become more and more of a reality every day. I've learned that I can be seasoned and not jaded. That Mm. it's my responsibility and duty to stay hopeful and optimistic, but not from a Pollyanna point of view, right? But from a place of belief that comes from my heart. I've learned to trust myself Mm. in a lifelong smashing down on my self-confidence, on my self-esteem, all the people wagging their judgmental finger at me, right? Figuratively, physically, that you ain't shit. You ain't Mm. ever going to be shit. What do you think you can organize and win? Who are you to think you can overturn capitalism? You ain't nothing. Mm. You can barely speak. When I worked at the foundation, they told me I didn't know how to write. Mm. And in so many rooms, feel like I didn't belong and I had no voice. Who am I to have an opinion? When I would speak, I would often be passed over, not heard. I've always wanted to be older, Jerry. All my life, I've wanted to be older. I wanted to be older so that my voice matters, that people will finally hear me. And I realized it's not about being old. It's just that white supremacy doesn't want our voice to flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's not about me. I've learned that love is an endless energy force that lives inside me, inside you, inside every single one of our listeners. And the more we trust it, the more it comes. It is not a glass of water that if we drink it, it's empty. It is a life force, a life energy that is unending if we cultivate it. 
And I've learned to love myself, to love you, and to love others. That is demanding. That is tough. That is real. Yep. That is hard. And sometimes can be a monster. And I know that's where you and I have intersected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for, for taking us on that journey, you know, of being vulnerable and sharing the path, not only that you've walked, but your ancestors have walked. Because what I know is that that is not just your journey. That's the journey of so many people that have come that way. And, and those are the things that this society doesn't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about the bondage. They don't want to talk about the, the cruelty. They don't want to talk about the patriarchy and the trying to stifle, you know, people's dreams and their voices. And and it so inspires me to hear that you can acknowledge that, but also at the same time recognize that you're not going to be bound, and you're not going to be stifled. And at the same time to to realize that through all of that journey, you know, comes uh, struggles, but comes lessons and blessings too. And to hear that out of all of that, you espouse love. <laughs> you espouse love that, that is hard sometimes because it's hard to love some folks. And it's hard to love in, in the midst of, of racism and oppression and consistent uh, brutality that, that is... You know, and and you know, I too, I too thought, well, I, I can't wait to get older. I can't wait to be an elder. I can't wait because, you know, first of all, I thought, oh, it's gonna be easier because I'll know more stuff, and 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 that's such a fact. Because <laughs> the older I get, the more I realize I don't know, and the harder it gets because the questions and the dilemmas that you are then confronted with are are more complex. Mm -hmm. But as as I see you, you know, and, and I've seen you in multiple settings orchestrate people's anger and orchestrate people's frustration and orchestrate people's dreams and orchestrate people's wishes in a group that are all very different. And you were the charge of how do I bring this to one voice? And I've seen the magic. And now I see where it comes from. Now I see where that magic comes from, from those grandmas and, and the bound feet, that in spite of the feet being bound, they continued to walk, and they continued to be who they were, and continued to, even without saying words, to motivate you on this journey so that you could have a voice, so that you knew that you had a voice, and and of course, that doesn't mean that you weren't going to get confronted and you weren't going to feel the, the pain of the oppression, the racism, but it's knowing that I don't have to fit into the binding that you're creating for me, you know. So, you know, I, I want to acknowledge you as an elder. I want to acknowledge you as a wisdom keeper. I want to acknowledge you as a blessed representative of your people on this journey that has really helped and supported so many people, so many people to find their voice, to unbind their spirits, yes. and to create voice so that we can, you know, have a better society for everyone. And we're not there, we'll, we'll never be there, but we're on that journey and it's voices like you and people like you with spirits like you that come with love, but also come with that you know, you remind me, I mentioned I had two grandmas. I had the one grandma that was a blessing grandma who would wake up and pray in the morning, then come and bless us up and feed us. And then I had that grandma that you, you didn't pay attention, she slapped the hell out of you and, you know, motivate you on. And, you know, and you have both of those elements in you. You know, you have that, the blessing, but you also have, we got to do some work here. We got some stuff to handle and I'm going to speak truth. I don't care if it offends you. I'm going to speak it. And I think as we get older, we learn how to finesse that a little bit. But you never lose the edge. You know, the, you never lose that edge. So, so, you know, with that, I'm wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about your work. Mm -hmm. And I say your work, but it's really your life purpose, you know, your journey. And what are those things, you know, that, 
you know, and it doesn't have to be just now. And say in the last ten years, what what has been your work and what has been your journey and what has been, you know, your your sacred purpose that you've been uh, guiding and and fulfilling along the way. It's such a blessing to hear you see me hmm. in the ways that you do, Jerry. So I want to acknowledge my gratitude for that. Yes, we have seen each other in multiple settings, and it's been such a joy to have you as a role model for me, mm. how to gracefully age into elderhood mm. and be such a important part of our ecosystems of healing, of justice, for freedom. So I thank you for that. Mm. I am just stepping into my growing elderhood. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen myself as an elder until I think this year and be seen and named and called that by others mm. have been such an honor. So I'm just at the very beginning yeah. of uh, this chapter in my life. So everything I know how to do, I've learned from organizing right? Here's a group of people, they want to do something. What is it that they want to do? Why do they want to do it? When do they want to do it by? What money do they have? What resources do they have? What people do they have? Not What knowledge do they have to do it with? Right? What pet weapons do they have? How will they know they're getting close? What are the markers on the road that's going to tell us that we're on the right path? And that we haven't strayed right off the path to our goal. So every room that I'm in, I feel like I can smell the energy. I can, mm. I can anticipate right the conversations. I can read the mood of people in that room without people having to speak. I feel like I've honed these skills all my life for my own survival. Mm -hmm. And through work, I have been able to use those spidey senses to actually help support the capacity of the group, the clarity of the group to come forth. I remember reading Mao Zedong, the little red book. That mm -hmm. was a mm -hmm. kind of a must have yes. back in the day, right? And one of the short quotes was, the eyes of the masses are clear. Trust that. So the masses, the people, they know what they need. They know what they want. They know what needs to be. And if we can silence, help silence the negative self-talk, the negative talk at each other, if we can help folks calm that down, not to get rid of it, mm -hmm. because that's all part of us, but to calm that down and to listen to their most audacious longings for themselves, for their families, for their community, and for each other. We will find that gem that is only possible in that room, no matter who's in there. So I steer towards that because I know it's there and I know the people are clear. Once they can drop their performative selves, once they can take down some of those hard masks that they've had to put on and return to that softness, that tender place inside and to dare to dream. When that's in the room, it's magic. It's pure joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's music to our souls that we can dance to. And I find my job, my calling in life is to help groups find that, feel it, touch it, color it, play with it, eat it if they want to, <laughs> right? And put it on and try it on. My life's work in a sentence would be that I bring a calm mirror for people and groups to see themselves so that their choices are more aligned with their hearts.
And I do that in my consulting work. I've been a consultant for 21 years now. It's hard mm-hmm. to believe. Yeah. I didn't even know what a consultant was before that. <laughs> you know what it is now? I, I still don't. <laughs> well, what I like to say is it's a loving helper. There you go. To help you shepherd along this journey, whatever journey you're on. Mm. Mm-hmm. With love, with toughness with mirrors and ask you to think about things that you may not want to think about or feel things you may not want to feel, but you know they're there inside each of us. (laughs) You know, it's amazing as you're speaking, you know, you talk about that spirit, that voice that knows, that feels, that senses, you know. In, in my journey, we recognize that as the ancestors speaking through you and the ancestors yes. channeling through you and, and giving you energy and spirit to be able to do things. And what I share with people, and this is what you're talking about, is if you can quiet your own mind, if you could quiet your own thoughts and your own expectations, then, then it will come through you. Exactly. And, and and you will hear and you'll be able to feel and, and sense, you know. And all, though all those are things that, you know, this society doesn't necessarily acknowledge or validate mm-hmm. or they see as something secondary. But what I felt and what I saw as you were speaking is I saw all these grandmothers around you. Mm-hmm. I saw them behind you right now. And I saw them shaking their head that says, yes, yes, she got it. And and that I believe that all people mm-hmm. have this medicine that they need to bring to the world to heal the world and to yes. guide it to a more sacred place. And that, you know, the work that you do, uh, your life work is really, how do we bring that out of each and every person? so they can feel their ancestors' dreams, Mm -hmm. you know, which is really the essence of acknowledging everyone and everything's sacredness. And you have been a steward of that and are that, you know. And I know that, uh, as you shared, and I feel so blessed that you've been willing to share the, the painful parts, the difficult parts, the dark shadow parts that, you know, that have challenged you. But what I have learned is That's part of the journey, too, Mm -hmm. because that has allowed you to not be afraid to go into those dark places and to struggle in those hard ways with people that have not been able to resolve that yet. Right. That's right. That are struggling. And and you mentioned it. You know, we work with people in communities that, you know, they're they're advocates, they're social advocates, social justice, but they're fighting amongst each other. Mm -hmm. You know, the pain that they have felt, that generational trauma now is coming out within groups, within us, and and the false teachings of society about ego and about hierarchy and about, you know, better knowledge then gets filtered in conversations, you know, and, and, and you have the wonderful uh, ability and skill and spirit and courage <laughs> to be willing to navigate that, right? Because there's a courage of being, you know, I have, me, I have to, <laughs> to manage all, and you know, we know folks, we know common folks that got strong spirits and strong wills, and 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 then they bring you in there to say, okay, <laughs> let's bring some some focus and cohesiveness to this, you know, and and so you know, I want people to recognize, you know, the 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 sacrifice and the courage and the struggle that it takes to really be doing authentic work like this. You know, and and that's what you exemplify. I'm wondering as we close, you know, come to to the closing of our circle today, of this dialogue, you know, I I know there's a lot of teachings and a lot of lessons, and I will, you know, directly refer to you as an elder, you know, and and, and we make, I make a differentiation between elder and older. Some people just get old, right? (laughs) Right. And and not that they don't have teachings, but they they're they're more in their struggles and more in their their anger and more in their pain that they haven't resolved. So they're not really sharing, you know, loving, helpful teachings. Not that they they're not teaching, but mm-hmm. but to me, you as an elder has chosen to work on that balance of balancing out the the struggles with the with the blessings and 
and then are courageous enough to be able to share and be in dialogue with it. So I'm wondering as an elder, as a wisdom keeper, as I will call you, you know, what is some counsel or advice that you give to that next generation? What would you tell the 25-year-old Cherie <laughs> you wish you would have known or, or others that are coming along the path? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, because I think this society does not honor elders and does not honor the wisdom of, and and not just us, but I'm talking about grandmas and grandpas that are walking down the street, going to the store, or just doing their day. They have wisdom too, mm-hmm. and and we don't honor that wisdom. You know, so I was wondering if you could you know reach into yourself and share some of that counsel advice that you would offer to other folks as they're moving along this journey of moving us to a place where we do see each other as sacred, where we're in a place of dealing with social justice in our communities, in our families, and and in ourselves as well. What would you offer? I think there are four things I would offer. Hmm. The first one is to trust yourself. Hmm. Trust your inner knowing that your path is a sacred one and to trust it. There will be twists and turns and detours and they are all gonna lead you along the sacred journey to what your life's purpose is. You may not know that now, but it will be revealed in time when you keep working on yourself and you keep trusting yourself. So listen to that voice, because if you don't, that voice is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm. The second is that we each have power to accept it, to embrace it, and to use it. Mm. If we don't use it, we lose it in the society Mm -hmm. that is set up as a zero-sum game. We each have power. Use it. Use it for good. Use it with love. Wield it with love. In measuring love, we talk about power as love and love as power. It can't be separated. Mm -hmm. It's how you use it, right? A lot of our colleagues and comrades are fighting to build power in society. But when it comes to their own power, they pretend like, oh, no, 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 I don't have any. Oh, no, 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 not me. I call BS on that. We each have power. Look at it. Grow it. Embrace it. Honor it. Because when you have power and you rise, everything that you are about rises with you. Mm -hmm. And we rise together. Mm -hmm. Third is we need boundaries as a sign that We are loving ourselves. And from within those boundaries, I love myself and I can love you. Mm. Without those boundaries, I'm just going to turn into a puddle of mush that is not useful for me or you. (laughs) So see boundaries as a loving demand from a place where we can love ourselves and really love the others in our lives. But it starts with healthy, conscious boundaries. And then the last thing, Jerry, I want to say is joy. (laughs) As I get older and older, I want more and more joy in my life because I want to be doing this till I can't do anything anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I look at you, like look at the work that you're doing. That is healing. That is meaningful, that is purposeful. And I want you to never stop. Mm. But what's going to enable that, right? It's joy Mm. in your life that sustains you. Every cell in your body is full of energy. Joy gives us that ability to feel the totality of our feelings from joy to grief and all the way through. We need to love all of it, not just one part of us, but all of us. So how does joy sustain me for the days when I will be in the dark Mm -hmm. with you, with others? 
I need to bring my best. And if I don't have joy in my life, I wouldn't be able to do crap for anybody. Mm -hmm. I think joy is underrated. Mm -hmm. Busy is overrated. Mm -hmm. Let's flip the order so that we can be doing this till our last breath on this earth. Mm, wow. Beautiful teachings. And, you know, um, you brought joy to me today, uh, just being with you, just listening to you, just dialoguing with you, just uh, reinforcing my own grandmother's teachings, but you allowing me a glimpse into your grandmother's teachings and your people's teachings as well. And, you know, I, I just want to thank you and acknowledge you for you know all that you have done and all that you do and and I know that you know this is also an avenue for us uh, to do more collaborative work together you know uh, there's a path that we're all on together and what I want to you know share with the audience are those four teachings that you know re mentioned but but I really want to emphasize the joy mm. today I want to emphasize the joy because I think that you know, we've been through the last couple of years in which people are in you know, deep fear. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in deep depression and sometimes tremendous anxiety about what is our life going to be. But what I've learned is that if you wake up in the morning, you know, you give gratitude and, and you can have joy for that. Yes. And for your relationships. And, and you mentioned, you know, if we're in darkness, we're in darkness together. And I remember growing up in Compton, we were in a lot of darkness, but man, we threw a party. You know, yes, <laughs> we're, right. We're all in dark, but we're going to throw a party. <laughs> and I, I don't care where we're at. We only had a little bit, you know, we, whatever yes. we had, we, we, we shared and, and, and had a good time, put some good music on and created joy. Yes. So joy is just something that's not just there sometimes. We must create it. We must recreate it. We must manifest it. Yes. And I believe that's what you've brought to us today. That vision, that dream, that hope and the pathway for us to recreate joy in our lives. But not just for us, right. it's for our ancestors, but it's also for the next seven generations that are coming. So I would, I wanna challenge that audience is to, is first of all, acknowledge your joy, bring some joy, do something enjoyable for yourself today, but reach out and, and offer joy to somebody else, you know? Sometimes that may need a little bit of forgiveness in order for you to bring that joy, but that's part of the work. Yes. But also just calling somebody in gratitude for their joy will manifest all of us. And, and you know, in, in the traditional sense of, of the Mayans and in like gets to it as mi otro, yo, you're my other me. When you create joy in yourself, the whole world begins to grow in joy that way. And, you know, so Sheree, I want to thank you again and, and you know, really uh, offer blessings to you and your journey. I want to thank the audience for listening and being with us today. And hopefully, you know, there's something that you took from this that is going to manifest joy in your life, that is going to encourage you to, uh, to do just a little bit more, a little bit better, a little bit more uh, work to create that, that justice and that love and that joy in, in yourself, in your families, and in our communities. And collectively, we can, we can do that together. I want to thank you once again. Reach out, leave us a, a response, you know, share this podcast with others, and we'll see you uh, next time around. Thank you very, very much. Glasso uh, Gomadli. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.